Hi there, my name is Theodor Mitev and in this short lecture I will discuss the process of analysis and synthesis or uh, as I've termed uh, that process, uh, breaking and reassembling the reel. And uh, our starting point is uh, this notion of uh, the world and our models of the world because, as I've pointed out elsewhere, uh, we perceive the world, we perceive our, perceive our surrounding reality, the environment in which we operate through a model or a frame, if you will. And these frames, these models through, uh, through which we perceive uh, reality can be uh, very simple, they can be very complex and detailed. However, they always already misalign with uh, the outside world, with the outside reality. They always already miss large chunks of it, if you will, uh, because the outside world, the environment uh, we operate in, is complicated. It's an ever-changing, chaotic uh, or, uh, environment, ever-changing, chaotic uh, world, which uh, cannot be captured in its entirety in some sort of static model, right? So this is the axiomatic uh, uh, base on which we built everything that follows. And this is really important to understand because uh, in uh, uh, as part of the modern condition, we are um, sort of raised into relying exceedingly on models of the world. And we take these models for granted, right? So we built a series of ever more complex assumptions based on underlying models of how the real is. And these, always, these models are always already wrong, right? So these models, uh, may have been at one time good approximations of how the world was back then, but uh, 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 that obviously the outside world has changed. Hence, these models are no longer applicable. And yet we still rely on them, yet we still build uh, uh, expertise on them uh, uh, and measure achievements according to them. So it's really important to keep in mind the limitations of our perception and uh, the way they affect our decision making and the way they affect our expectations and assumptions about the world. All right, so the world is complicated, it's chaotic, it's ever changing. And uh, as uh, military theorist uh, John Boyd famously pointed out, uh, because of these underlying conditions, which are non negotiable, the world simply is that way, we must continuously interact in a variety of ways with, with that world, with our environment, in order to gain uh, feedback from that world and to discern changes, to discern changes in the underlying conditions. And this, on the face of it, uh, superficially sounds quite trivial, right? So it's a banal observation that, yes, we need to interact with our environment in order to figure out what's going on, but uh, there is a deeper uh, uh, conceptual level uh, here that uh, is often missed, which is that um, we have to operate in a, in a sense, uh, sense uh, in a suspended state of uh, 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 modeling about the world because uh, each new interaction with the outside continuously updates the model that we're building right now. So the, our if we truly adopt this notion of continuous interaction in a variety of ways with our environment in order to discern what's going on, then the models which we build will never be stable enough so that we can build long-term long assumptions based on them. They will be dynamic, right? So there is a deeper issue here uh, at stake, which uh, I'm going to unpack down the track in this lecture. And the, the, the reason for this uh, uh, requirement of continuous engagement with the outside world, of continuous search for stimuli, continuous search for uh, feedback loops with, with the surrounding environment, is, as John Boyne points out, uh, because uh, this is the only way we can generate mental images or impressions that correspond to that world, right? So, and even if we are able to develop them, they are always already temporary, right? They are always already uh, poor reflections on complex and chaotic uh, external environment. And uh, importantly, uh, 
uh, it is uh, crucial to adopt this notion of, of a number of perspectives, right? So even if the perspectives which we are adopting uh, to examine uh, external conditions, to examine the, uh, uh, the world, the, the environment in which we operate, uh, even if these perspectives are mutually exclusive or diametrically opposite or, or cancelling each other out, um, it's, it is crucial to uh, be able to and to continuously adopt these kinds of perspectives um, in order to be able to see changes in that environment. Because it is, uh, um, uh, it, it's always tempting to uh, deploy a model which has proved successful, right? So let's say we've, we've uh, figured out that this perspective on the world is currently more or less corresponding to the current state of our external conditions. And so again, remember that this discussion uh, applies not only to uh, individual states in normal, let's say, simple laboratory conditions of every, everyday life, which is uh, often built of, of long-standing routines, but uh, it, this also applies equally, so the, uh, uh, both individuals and large organizations and, and, and global organizations and complex structures are on the same ontological plane because they are all subject to the same problem, right, of figuring out what is going on, the problem of perception. So um, the issue here is that it's really tempting to uh, keep applying the same perspective, the same frame or model that has proved successful so far. Why? Because uh, you know it proved successful. So at one point, at point A, it corresponded to the outside conditions and it was successful in helping us navigate those outside conditions. But uh, when outside conditions change and we keep deploying the same model, we run into problems. And when this is uh, continued we fall into a state of inertia, right? We fall into a state where we are tied to that model because the cost of changing it, the outside conditions have changed to such an extent that the cost of changing our model is, is prohibitive at this stage. So we are running at a huge, uh, uh, in this case expressed as an equation that, you know, in effect, you're running at, at a huge energy loss uh, because of the cost of uh, 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 adapting to the outside world because the model which you have deployed as your operational model, the, the way you see reality and the way you imagine uh, you should be acting in reality is so far disconnected from that reality, right? It, it does not overlap with it at all, right? So this leads to inertia and event to an eventual inevitable crisis and uh, uh, collapse and catastrophe simply because of that disconnect between the internal model and the external conditions. And so in this context, how we act in the world uh, becomes uh, a, a, of crucial importance uh, because uh, our actions, and, uh, continuous actions in a, in a given setting, in a given environment, uh, end up determining, um, you know, what we will do next and also determining our perception of that external environment. And this is uh, brilliantly uh, summarized by, uh, again, by John Boyd in his uh, classic presentation on destruction and creation. And uh, so I will read this passage because it's really uh, uh, fundamental. Um, against such a background, actions and decisions become critically important. Actions must be taken over and over again and in many different ways. Decisions must be rendered to monitor and determine the precise nature of the actions needed that will be compatible with the goal. To make these timely decisions implies that we must be able to form mental concepts of observed reality as we perceive it and be able to change these concepts as reality itself appears to change. Alright, so let's unpack this a little bit. So actions must be taken over and over again. So we have this notion of iterative uh, processual uh, agencies or actions which uh, are iteratively engage with an environment in many different ways in order to probe, if you will, that surrounding environment and, and to understand it as much as possible, map it as much as possible and understand its changes as much as possible. And this is tied to decisions because 
as these actions are being taken, there is a, there is a level of reflexive observation, of monitoring uh, and observation in order to determine the nature of the future actions that will be necessitated. So you have a model of reality emerging, which uh, is informed by the past actions in, 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 in aggregate and uh, uh, determines the potential direction of future actions. And so this model is what Boyd calls uh, a mental concept of observed reality. And the key thing here is the, his insistence, right? So notice he, he keeps in, returning to this and insisting that uh, we must be able to change this mental concept. We need to, uh, we must be able to, uh, uh, on a dime, uh, uh, abandon a model uh, when the uh, underlying conditions, when reality itself appears to change, right? So um, this is uh, the the kind of conceptual framework within which we will be discussing the problem of analysis and synthesis. And if you've uh, paid attention so far, you would uh, uh, be able to deduce that there is a, I'm pointing at a certain mindset that is necessary in order to be able to perform analysis and synthesis. And in this mindset is first starting with these axiomatic positions that uh, we already described, right, with this notion of uh, a chaotic external uh, reality and stimuli, which uh, we have to engage with continuously probing uh, from uh, a variety of different perspectives, you know, in a variety of different ways in order to build a, a conceptual model of that reality and be ready and flexible enough to abandon that model the moment it turns out to be inappropriate already for dealing uh, with that external reality. And it is with this mindset that we can, together with Franklin Spinney, uh, uh, point out that uh, when you notice that your operant model of reality is inadequate, when you notice that uh, your, uh, th this conceptual framework that you've built about what is happening and what should happen next and what your actions should be, what your decisions should be, uh, that this uh, uh, operant uh, model is uh, inadequate, that is misaligned in one way or another with uh, external conditions, that is when you see something new and strange, right? Because you are learning a new way of doing things and thinking about the world, right? So, uh, insofar as you don't uh, that uh, you don't have this mindset of being able to. Uh, look outside of your model, this is a really hard perspective to develop, right? Because from that uh, uh, rigid dogmatic perspective, um, when things go out of whack, you don't see something new and strange that we can learn something. You, you see something that should be either attacked or ignored, right? So this is a, a, this dogmatic rigid perspective on reality according to which uh, there is only one correct way of looking at things, only one correct way of operating in the world, one correct uh, uh, dogma of how things should be. And anyone and everything that does not fit that model, that dogma, should be purged, attacked, destroyed. Right? So this is obviously a, a recipe for inertia and catastrophe and disaster of, of, of collapse. Um, and conversely, if you have that mindset of the flexible uh, uh, cognitive uh, and perceptual model of uh, uh, reality, then when uh, things go out of whack, we can see something new and strange, and that is when learning begins. That's when we can learn something. So what is that mindset? What is that uh, frame uh, which allows this kind of, uh, of uh, maneuvering and this kind of flexibility. And um, uh, probably the best way to describe it, in my uh, uh, opinion, is uh, through this notion of the analysis frame. So you adopt a, a way of thinking which is uh, uh, organized around analysis. And it can, uh, in my opinion, can be summed up in this way. that you, you have to continuously presume that your assumptions about how things are and should be are wrong. Right. Or could be wrong. And this, this uh, axiomatic presumptions that a presumption that uh, your model is probably wrong allows you to continuously look for ways to improve it 
and or change it. And conversely, again, if uh, your operant uh, uh, fundamental presumption is that your model, your, your frame is correct and it is the only correct way of uh, uh, looking at all, then uh, obviously none of this makes sense because you presume you are always correct that you, you uh, you're doing what uh, you know what uh, should be done or what uh, the, uh, an authority figure has declared is the truth or uh, some sort of expert has declared that is the truth and how things really are and uh, um, yeah there is no analysis in that case in your model of reality is blind faith however if you are you're tr trying to think analytically then the correct first step the correct uh, 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 foundational maneuver, if you will, is this presumption that your assumptions about the world, about how things really are, are wrong. And this operates on a, obviously on a um, very uh, abstract level uh, when um, you know you are conceptually trying to describe your relationship to, to the uh, outside uh, environment, but it's, uh, uh, it, it can also be described in a very pragmatic, uh, um, if you will, day-to-day um, -day, uh, trivial reality level, because uh, this, this um, assumption that your take on something, on a problem, uh, or as uh, um, uh, Eric Raymond, the, the famous programmer and author of the Cathedral and the Bazaar, uh, describes it uh, uh, your concept of the problem. Um, if you, if you have this assumption that your concept of the problem is wrong uh, or may be wrong, then you start being open to all sorts of striking and creative solutions, right? So the way Eric Kramer frames it, often the most striking and innovative solutions come from realizing that your concept of the problem was wrong, right? So what does this mean, realizing that your concept of the problem was wrong? So you, you have uh, a model of what the problem is. You have a model of some sort of set of external conditions. And realizing that your model is wrong opens you automatically to a completely new way of thinking about that problem, simply because you're operating outside of your previous model. And again, this can, can be viewed on a very superficial level, but you can... Uh, uh, zoom out if you will, to, a, to a much more abstract way of thinking about this, which leads to a, a set of very interesting observations about the process of analysis. So let's dive into that. And the first, the first step here is what is involved in the process of analysis, something that uh, we can describe as deductive thinking. Uh, and deductive uh, thinking uh, here stands for uh, operating from the macro to the micro, from a large uh, structure from a model of the real in this case to details right so you are you start with the whole and you break it down into parts and this is basically a, a very simple summary of what analysis is in practice you always start with some sort of whole with some it can be a, a, a concept or it can be a model it can be a structure or it can be an organization can be can be anything which can be viewed as a whole and you start breaking that whole into parts this could can be constituent elements parts arguments ideas etc etc this process of breaking the whole into parts is really important it's really interesting to to dive into it a little bit deeper because uh it's nowhere near as easy as it sounds uh most people are highly reluctant to question any and all models which they used to think with and observe reality through. Right? So you have to understand this. Uh, most people are, are reluctant to do that because uh, there, is a, there is a very high cost associated with questioning your own model of reality because you, you are continuously proving yourself wrong, right? first and foremost. Uh, also, there is a cost of examining your past actions and your potential future actions based on a model which is faulty. Right. Um, uh, and also, there is a, a, a level of, of questioning here, which uh, is uncomfortable to a lot of people who are uh, trained from from a very young age to uh, obey blindly authority 
obey blindly the experts, you know, so experts agree. So every time you hear experts agree, uh, you should be automatically hearing a total denial of analytical and deductive thinking, right? Because uh, uh, there's no such thing, there's no such starting position as experts agree. It's an artificial uh, construct and it's a false a priori artificial construct uh, because it builds a, a position of authority out of nothing, in effect. Um, you, you, it, this this, this uh, analytical mindset is a mindset of continuous questioning of uh, models of reality, of breaking down models, models of reality into their constituent parts. And importantly, and this is a crucial point, it's only half of the process, right? So it's a mindset of deductive thinking and it's a, a half of a larger process because analysis is always followed by synthesis. Right? which is characterized by a completely different type of thinking, which we describe as inductive thinking. So while deductive thinking was about breaking the whole into constituent parts, inductive thinking is about building from the bottom up, from constitu uh, constituent elements, from bits and pieces, it could be found bits and pieces, whatever, into a new whole. Right? So you're building from the bottom up as opposed to from the top down when it comes to deductive thinking. So notice you have two different mindsets operating in play in a continuous cycle. Deductive thinking, breaking down existing models of reality, followed by inductive thinking, which builds up new models of reality from existing uh, uh, elements. So when we ask someone to, uh, for example, when we ask someone to analyze a situation, or analyze a problem. In effect, we are analyzing uh, that person to, we are, we are asking that person to uh, break down that situation and or problem into its constituent elements. Right? So it, uh, that, this, this mode of thinking, this deductive perspective on, on the problem, on the situation, requires a deep level of understanding of how this uh, situation is performed into being in the first place or how this uh, issue or problem is uh, is appearing so it requires a, 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 a deep level of understanding of uh, what what generates a situation what what creates a problem uh, what is involved for example in making a certain organization work if you are analyzing an organization etc uh, etc et right so it requires a level of um, understanding of the minute of uh, the logistics of the mechanics of uh, some sort of whole, whatever that might be. It might be an organization, a problem, an issue, a person, etc. Right. So uh, it's a specific mindset about of noticing the emergence of these uh, of these uh, elements which form a whole. And again, it's nowhere near as easy as it sounds because most people are not. Uh, uh, conditioned at all to think of reality as something which has to be performed by a myriad of smaller actors. Right? So people are conditioned usually by years of education to think about reality in a very superficial way uh, according to an established model which is you, know, you can view it as a, the product of an industrial assembly line with one size fits all uh, uh, stencil kind of thinking. You know? This is caused by that and this is the, the, the end the beginning and the end of, of uh, uh, you know what passes for analysis usually why because of the inability to break down uh, a macro into its constituent elements and conversely when we ask someone to synthesize something new or usually it's not framed in terms of these terms it's framed usually in terms of uh, create something new uh, a completely new set of uh, 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 problems appear uh, again because usually people are not conditioned and not uh, uh, exposed to thinking about reality in terms of the, the possibilities of true synthesis, of true operation outside of a model. Because for synthesis to appear as a concept in the first place, you need to be building a new whole out of parts. You cannot be operating within an existing model. Because if you're operating within an existing model, all you're doing is perpetuating the assumptions of that model. You're not synthesizing anything new. Right? There's no inductive thinking whatsoever. You're just copying and pasting keywords, basically. So when it comes to understanding 
uh, deductive and inductive thinking in the context of this continuous process of uh, analysis and synthesis, you have to think of this as a cycle which involves pulling apart when it comes to deductive analytical uh, uh, thinking and, and that part of the process and then building anew when it comes to uh, uh, inductive thinking and synthesis and that part of the process. And this is a continuous loop, right? This is what the mind performs under optimal conditions when you're really trying to create your own models of reality and analyzing them and uh, uh, pulling them apart and building them anew. And if you have paid attention so far uh, and if you understood everything I've tried to explain, um, you, 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 it should be quite clear why uh, I said what I said a little bit earlier when I, when I was talking about authority figures and experts, is this, this, this reified concepts that, uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, entities that should be followed uh, blindly and obeyed blindly. Um, because when the moment there is some sort of blind obedience of faith in or belief in and following of, uh, you have completely abandoned that terrain in which analysis and synthesis occurs. Right? You, are, you are operating in a uh, basically some sort of inertia bound, catastrophe bound uh, situation. So now let's move on. What uh, the key thing here, the key takeaway is that. Uh, pulling things apart, analysis is only half of the movement. This is an ongoing cyclical process uh, and you have to then put uh, things back together uh, in a new way. You need to synthesize them in a new way. So analysis and synthesis are closed loop. So let's start with analysis now. Let's focus on pulling things apart. And uh, uh, the classic example that I'm showing here it comes from uh, uh, John Boyd. Um, and this is uh, the example of these uh, three disparate objects. Notice how each of these objects on the screen represents completely different uh, starting conditions, completely different environments, completely different types of objects, if you will. Right. So uh, first we have a motorbike and then we have a water ski and uh, some sort of uh, uh, power boat. And then uh, finally, we have uh, all-terrain uh, tracked vehicle. So we have a simple road vehicle. We have uh, something that operates on water only. And then we have something which is designed for uh, extreme conditions, usually uh, snow. And what happens if we start pulling these uh, apart? Because remember, analysis involves pulling things apart. It involves... Uh, uh, breaking apart a whole into its constituent elements. So what happens when we do that in this case? And uh, uh, when, when we look at the uh, motorbike, we, what do we have? We have wheels, we have uh, uh, the, the handles, we have uh, the seat, we have the lights, um, and, uh, and the, uh, the engine, obviously. Uh, and, and the frame. So uh, when we look at uh, the water ski, we have the ski, we have uh, the boat itself, the frame of the boat, and we have the outboard motor. And when we look at the all-terrain track vehicle, the, obviously the, the first thing that stands out is the tracks, and then we have uh, the, the uh, frame of the entire uh, vehicle and the engine, etc., etc., all of its internal elements that are not visible here. So notice that We've, we've broken these down into their constituent elements. And he, if you've done this maneuver in your mind as you are watching this, uh, uh, these images, uh, you would realize that uh, ideally, in an ideal scenario, you've reached the end point of uh, uh, deductive thinking, right? So you've uh, uh, broken down this uh, whole yeah, structures into the uh, constituent elements. You've uh, analyzed the relationship between these elements and you're starting to think about this bunch of, uh, um, you know, disparate elements belonging to different groups of uh, objects, to different environments, right? You're looking at them from, let's say, from a bird eye uh, view and uh, trying to think what to do next, right? So 
then you need to close the cycle so you need to move from deductive to inductive thinking right so you've broken down the hole and now you need to start from the bottom and build up right so uh, from the constituent elements and start building uh, up towards a new hole so you need to put things together in a new way uh, so from analysis to synthesis so we broke down broke down the constituent elements of these disparate uh, objects and we can reassemble them in a completely new way right so in, again this is following john boyd's example the classic example of uh, analysis and synthesis in practice so what we can take the the handlebars and the seat from the motorbike uh, we can take the outboard motor and the uh, skis from the uh, water ski uh, uh, situation and then we have we can take the tracks from the uh, old terrain vehicle from the atv and we can assemble these together into a completely new object and this new object would be the snowmobile right so what is interesting about this example is that the snowmobile is in no way an evolutionary development of uh, uh, any of these objects right it cannot be depicted as the evolution of the atv or of uh, water skis or of a uh, motorbike right it's a completely new category of object and uh, what is important to underline here is that uh, you have uh, eliminated a large number of objects from the previous models right so you had the, the motorbike the water ski and the atv and there's a huge number of objects from these uh, uh, or rather a huge number of constituent elements from these objects that you've eliminated you don't need them anymore you've reassembled a new model right which doesn't need them anymore so this is really important to keep in mind because when it comes to our thinking about the real and when it comes to the development of uh, uh, new models of perception new frames or even when it comes to the reassembling of completely new entities uh, uh, after uh, analysis and creative synthesis so this can be new organizations etc etc uh, Hereby, disparate elements are combined to form a new whole um, and uh, elements which previously might have been considered essential or crucial are now discarded, right? So notice, this is a really strange, really interesting observation here. So uh, until the moment of analysis, there was a, a, a probably a long list of elements which would have been considered crucial for their environment. But in this new uh, uh, synthesized object, uh, it, these, these uh, uh, hereby crucial elements do, do not uh, uh, appear, right? they, are, they are not needed and they have been discarded. So here we have uh, uh, the, the example of synthesis in practice and uh, while pulling things apart was a deductive process, uh, putting things together in a new way is an inductive process. It involves creative synthesis, right? creating something new, some, some new whole out of uh, uh, distinct parts. All right, so now let's think about uh, what is involved in the, the two frames here. What kind of uh, uh, kind of mindset uh, assumptions, what ways of thinking and uh, what processes when it comes to analysis and synthesis. And let's start with analysis here, uh, the way I've termed it uh, the analysis frame. So the first uh, step is uh, what we already established. You have to presume your assumptions about how things are and should be uh, wrong or potentially wrong. Uh, this frame involves uh, a continuous iterative creative destruction of one's own uh, mental structures, one's own models of reality. And this is fundamental, right? We, this is presumed in this process of questioning one's assumptions. And it involves a continuous analysis of perceived reality, right? So you, uh, absent this last point, none of this would make sense. You, you need to be continuously engaged in pulling apart what you perceive as the real and trying to understand it, trying to uh, continuously engage with it and uh, uh, understand why things are in this way and not in any other way right because uh, you need to be doing that if you are able to if you are to be able to analyze your own assumptions about the real 
and if you are able to undergo through this process of creative destruction of ones uh, of your own uh, assumptions of your own mental structures and if uh, we think about uh, analysis as a process uh, as, as this process of continuous breaking uh, of assumptions and continuous breaking of models uh, you have in a, you have a really interesting set of observations appearing the first one is this this notion of continuous deployment which you can observe already in uh, uh, in practice successfully in uh, 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 you know IT and software world uh, where you have many small incremental daily updates so you can abstract from from this uh, uh, coding and software example to uh, you know the, the realm of uh, you know abstract thinking you need to continuously uh, deploy um, small incremental changes to an existing model right this model is, can never be static right this model should be continuous undergoing a continuous dynamic uh, incremental updating uh, with uh, with updates from from uh, uh, the real right from the outside um, the following observation is this notion of uh, agile development right so it's uh, um, very short deployment cycles and continuous uh, iteration and it, it connects to continuous deployment right you need to be continuously um, uh, engaging with uh, with uh, uh, the model that you're deploying and uh, uh, iterating through possible ways of improving that model so you have short deployment cycles in the case here the example is again from software and coding so you have short deployment cycles of uh, of uh, some sort of new code new uh, software and continuous iteration continuous improvement and the next uh, point is uh, um, building on the previous two uh, on continuous deployment and agile development and it's focused on uh, this, this notion of uh, uh, decentralized decision making where you have uh, when in the case of an organization you have uh, multiple uh, actors, multiple agents uh, being involved in the full deployment cycle, be, being able to uh, make decisions and update the model, right? So in order to build uh, even quicker feedback loops between uh, uh, iterations and uh, even faster deployment cycles. And uh, this is important uh, in the context of uh, uh, operating in this... Uh, in the, in this um, uh, model of, of uh, continuous analysis, right? So deploying an, this analytical framework as a model of action, and from viewed from the uh, from from the outside, the this this looks really interesting. It looks as if uh, the model um, is is broken and it's in permanent beta. It's uh, it looks as if uh, uh, the way of thinking is continuously being updated, right? So, you had, uh, if we were to abstract here when it comes to the, the uh, you know, mental models, because you could be thinking of this is the way I've uh, uh, displayed it. You could be thinking of this also in terms of, uh, um, you know, way of working, for example, of how a, how an organization uh, could be operating in practice, and we can see this. Uh, phenomena appear in practice very often when it comes to uh, uh, internet startups, when it comes to decentralized finance, blockchain operations, uh, where uh, there is a priority on very quick analysis, on very quick iteration, on very quick adaptability to a changing environment, right? Hence, we have breaking as a process, continuous deployment, agile development, decentralized decision making. All right, now let's think about uh, synthesis. And uh, we first started by establishing the analytical frame, the analysis frame. So now let's establish the uh, synthesis frame so in terms of uh, a way of thinking, the mindset. So uh, the first point is uh, this, that uh, it involves uh, uh, the conscious operating outside of pre-existing models, right? So even if the starting conditions are the same as before, uh, do it differently so uh, even if you're operating with the same uh, um, constituent elements that you were operating in before uh, the, the uh, this notion of creative synthesis involves trying to do things differently just as uh, uh, John, John Boyd pointed out right you want to be uh, adopting different perspectives in your engagement with reality consciously in order to probe in different ways so even if it's all the same do it differently 
And then uh, this, this, the second point here is, uh, uh, again, a direct uh, link to the example I gave. So uh, when you aim to put together disparate elements, uh, you, you have this uh, often this result that uh, you have in, uh, unexpected and interesting uh, effects, right? So completely new things might emerge out of putting together in a new way disparate elements that were not put together before. Right. So, so again, the importance of operating outside of existing models, of doing things and thinking about things. And then the final point is that synthesis, like analysis, is not a one-off. Right. So this is a continuous process. So continuous synthesis of the elements of perceived reality. So you're analyzing and synthesizing continuously. All right. So uh, let's think now about uh, uh, synthesis as a process, just like we thought uh, of uh, analysis as a process. So when you think of synthesis as a process, while analysis was breaking, we could call synthesis remaking. So remaking as a process, the first uh, uh, um, point I wanted to make is that uh, uh, it's, it seems to be really important to find common qualities between disparate elements. Because remember, you're building from the bottom up. This is an inductive process. So you're operating with a, a, a large number of disparate elements that um, you need to put together in a new way. So aim to find common qualities, attributes or operations among the elements that you've identified after analysis. Right? So you, uh, these can be completely disparate elements, like in the example of the motorbike, water ski, and the uh, uh, old uh, terrain track vehicle that uh, we found uh, uh, we found common elements in each one of those in order to put together a snowmobile, right? So again, the 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 notion of putting together disparate elements. The next point is uh, the the, the um, point of uh, avoiding repetition. Um, and again, remember that this is a, a process of uh, uh, operating outside of uh, existing models. So it's really important to avoid building uh, inertia situations where you are repeating previous actions which were uh, you know, designed to operate in a different model. So it, the importance of uh, uh, avoiding to uh, using the same elements and arrangement as in the model you just pulled apart. Um, another point. Uh, often it may be that uh, um, the, these new models and solutions we are looking for will emerge from the combination of elements that we presume to be incompatible. Again, when you operate in a model which assumes that uh, elements A, B, C and D are incompatible for whatever reason, and this might, might be a correct assumption under a given set of external conditions, when you are outside of this model, it's really important to uh, stop operating according to the assumptions of the model you, which you've just left, right? So if under these assumptions you presume that these elements are incompatible, it is now important to try and check again whether they're still incompatible by trying to combine them and make them work together. And uh, crucially, uh, we are, again, we're trying to build from the bottom up uh, inductively uh, a whole, a new whole uh, out of uh, uh, these, these components that have emerged uh, after our analysis. Uh, but uh, uh, it's really important that the new model, whatever it is that you're building, it can be a new type of object, you know, a, new, a new mental model of reality or a new organization, etc., etc. It might, must be internally and externally consistent. So internally, it, uh, all of these new elements should be able to work together and cohere, right? So uh, you know, the snowmobile should be able to, to do its job and move on snow, basically. Uh, and uh, uh, externally consistent means it should be able to react with an external environment. So in this, in the case of the snowmobile, we want that snowmobile to be able to uh, uh, operate on snow. And, uh, uh, you know, if you have different types of snow uh, occurring and, uh, you know, some sort of change in conditions, it should not break down immediately. Right? It should be consistent. It should be internally and externally consistent. So uh, when this occurs, we could say that the new model, the new uh, synthesized 
object or entity or, or organization, whatever, is in some sort of uh, uh, overlapping uh, relation with uh, end correspondence with external conditions, with the external environment, right? Again, though, remember, this would be up to a point, right? Because no model is permanently uh, coherent with external conditions. No model is good enough and, and precise enough in order to be able, in order to be said to be uh, permanently corresponding and true. Uh, to, to external conditions, to uh, chaotic and ever-changing real. So, uh, just as we had uh, uh, breaking as a process or analysis as a process, here we have remaking as a process. Um, and the main uh, uh, points that uh, I focused on are you know, finding common qualities among uh, these disparate elements that were identified uh, after analysis, uh, avoiding uh, the pairing of the same elements and arrangements, uh, as uh, in the previous model, um, having that mindset that uh, the assumptions in the previous model about uh, what is compatible with what should be abandoned, so we should be trying to pair incompatible elements. And finally, the new whole that we're building should be internally and externally consistent. And so we've gone through uh, the frame the mindset of uh, analysis and the, the uh, frame the mindset of synthesis we've uh, talked about the process of analysis and the process of synthesis so presumably we've closed the full loop the full cycle of analysis and synthesis and we've uh, we've been able to build something new a new model of uh, uh, reality for example or, or a new object or a new organization whatever the thing is that the, that this new model is uh, a priori, so you have to assume from the beginning that it is not perfect and it might be, in fact, uh, highly imperfect, right? So uh, it's really important, as we said at the very beginning, uh, you open the loop by taking this assumption on board that your, your model of reality is wrong and you close the loop by returning to the same assumption. Why? Because this is a continuous process. The cycle of analysis and synthesis does not stop. The cycle of pulling apart the real and building it anew, right, is a new model, does not stop. It's a continuous process. Why? Because external conditions are chaotic and ever-changing. In order to be able to operate in uh, this kind of world, and to maintain your, your ability and your capacity to, to make decisions, right? so your capacity for decision making and action in this kind of uh, chaotic, ever changing uh, environment, you have to be continuously analyzing and synthesizing, continuously breaking and remaking your existing conceptual model. And uh, this is because if you stop this process and you uh, decide to stick to some sort of established model. This model could be coming from the highest authority, from the best experts, right? All the experts agree, all the scientists agree, right? So this is usually how this kind of static, unchanging, um, kind of belief-based models, how they are framed. Right? Otherwise, no one would follow them anyways. So uh, if you were to stop the process of analysis and synthesis and, and choose instead to, uh, to, to operate on a kind of belief-based model, this automatically leads, it's an axiomatic uh, relationship, you, it leads to inertia, crisis, collapse, catastrophe. And um, the final quote is, uh, the final slide that I wanted to show you is, uh, again, uh, this quote from uh, Franklin Spinney, with which we started, uh, when things go out of whack, we can see something new and strange, and that is when we learn something. Um, even with the best of our efforts in, in, in a continuous state of analysis and synthesis, things will go out of whack, right? Because no model, no matter how sophisticated or no matter how iterative, will be perfectly capable of uh, explaining the real and things will be going out of whack but the the, the correct uh, uh, mindset when this happens is to look at this at this breakage of this gap at this glitch if you will of our model as an opportunity to learn something new if you have any questions 
please hit me up on Twitter at TedMeetYou. Uh, thank you for listening to me and see you online.